Good evening. Once again, it is good to see each of you here. What a beautiful and wonderful day we have that we may gather together to sing such wonderful songs. Uh, and isn't it good, as that last song reminded us, that though this world can seem chaotic and though Satan is the prince of this world, it is still our Father's world, isn't it? It is still his creation. It is still he who reigns forever and ever. Tonight we're going to be looking at a lesson that we uh, find, uh, I guess you could say topically, from John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, starting in verse 31, we see Jesus start talking to a group of Jews who had recently started believing in him. Now the Pharisees before this had been arguing back and forth with Jesus there in John chapter 8. And due to Jesus' response, his knowledge, and how he handled such with the Pharisees, it says there in John chapter 8 and verse 30 that many Jews began to believe in him. Now that's important to realize when we consider the following events that take place there in the book of John because these are new believers, these are recent ones who see this one calling himself the Messiah, talking like the Messiah, bringing up valid truthful facts concerning the prophecies as, as they relate to him and they start uh, seeing that and recognizing that. And Jesus then informs them, those who are these newly believed Jew, Jews of Jesus and his Messiahship, Jesus starts talking to them in verses 31 through 38 about how being set free. Now, when we look at their response, which was not favorable to this, we see that they did not like the idea of being told they were slaves to anything. Jesus had just described, listen, if you want to be set free from being slaves of sin, you need to obey truth. You need to follow God. Their response to that was that we've been slaves to no one. We're Abraham's offspring. Now, obviously, they weren't really looking back historically speaking because in reality, since Assyria took over the 10 tribes of Israel during the divided kingdom and then uh, a few hundred years later when Babylon uh, took over the southern kingdom, they had been under someone else's control from that point on, whether it be the Medo-Persians, the Greeks after that, or at this time, the Romans. We even remember, of course, that they could not execute Jesus like they wanted to. They had to go to Pilate and get permission. They were not free. But yet, Jesus declaring to them, if you want to be set free from your sins, to no longer be slaves of sin, and to be set free, you have to follow me. You have to look at what I'm saying, which is truth. The truth, he says there, will set you free. Now, that response by these Jews is important. Because Jesus then starts pointing some very vital things out to them. And one of the things that he says, based on how they responded to him, was, listen, if you think you're not slaves to sin, you're not listening to your heavenly father, you're listening to your earthly fathers. You're not listening to God, you're listening to man. And then he goes, starting in John chapter 8 and verse 44, to describe who man listens to and because they're listening to man whom they are listening to. He says there in John chapter 8 verse 44, 
You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Now, Jesus makes some very powerful statements to these newly believing Jews. Yes, they were starting to come around. Yes, they had started to realize and believe Jesus, this one, this man might be the Messiah. But they were still, instead of listening to God, they were listening to the father of lies. They had and were still getting caught up in Satan and him. Today, when we think about life and we think about time, one of the things that's very easily noticed is that from the time we find Satan and Eve interacting, Satan has been using the same basic lies all throughout the centuries. Tonight, what we're going to look at, what we're going to examine is the three lies he gave to Eve. The three lies he told to her that she took hook, line, and sinker. And notice how they are still being applied today. If you have your hand out, let's look at our first point this evening. Lie number one, God is a restrictive God. Satan wants not only the world, but you and I to believe that God is restrictive, that he doesn't actually want us to be able to do anything. Look at what he tells Eve there in Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 5. And think about this idea here of restrictive and how he's talking to Eve about how God doesn't want to let her do anything. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now there's several things in there that we're going to unpack later, two other lies within this text that we're going to look at. But the first one I want us to really think of is this idea that he has placed in Eve's mind and very easily can be placed in anyone's mind, and that is God is a restrictive God. Have you ever heard someone say, listen, I don't want to be a part of your God because he limits what I want to do. He limits my happiness, the things that I want to do. He's just simply a God of thou shalt not, in other words. You and I, I'm sure, have heard people say this. I know I have. When it comes to looking at God, following God, and living for Him, people get caught up in this idea. Well, this God who created everyone and supposedly loves everyone, all He does is tell everybody what they can't do. Why would anyone want to be restricted by that? The world obviously is bought into that whether it be atheism and the idea that, listen, they don't want anyone telling them what to do, or, or denominationalism, which says, listen, I want to be able to have the church of my choice. I don't really want anyone restricting me on how I worship or how I obey God and follow Him. The world has fallen prey to this, and sometimes even the church, we can get caught up in it. Sometimes even in the church, we can uh, start to think about all the things that uh, we start piling on. Well, I can't do this and I can't do that. We start thinking of God as a very restrictive God. 
What do you mean I, I can't smoke or drink or gamble or uh, I can't party or, or hang out with friends like I used to? I, what do you mean I can't uh, go watch uh, rated R movies or, or do these kinds of things? What do you mean uh, on Sundays and, and Wednesdays I can't do what I want to do? I, I should uh, come and be with everybody else. What do you mean by that? So many times people have bought into the lie that God is restrictive. But the reality is just the opposite of that. The truth is just the opposite of that. God, who created us, knows us better than, as we talked about this morning in Bible class, knows us better than we even know ourselves. In Romans 8, it says the Holy Spirit literally searches our spirit to know what to tell God in our weaknesses because we don't even know what we need. God knows us better than ourselves. And that God, our God, says, I want you to be happy. In fact, he would declare it uh, this way in John 16, 40, uh, 24. Until you have asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. God wants our joy to be full. He's not restricting us from happiness and joy. He's not restricting us to, and keeping us from doing those things that will make us happy. He's keeping us from those things that will destroy us, that will ultimately hurt us. And that is never satisfying, but always momentary. God wants our joy to be full. The psalmist would declare it this way in Psalm 34 and verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The Lord is good. He wants us to be blessed or happy. The one who is blessed, the one who is full of joy, the one who is excited about life and gets through this life is the one who who takes refuge in him. It's not the one who's outside of Christ, as we talked about this morning. It's the one in Christ today. Paul in Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Satan wants us to believe that our creator is trying to stifle us, trying to restrict us, trying to keep us from having fun or having the most fulfilled <coughs> life in this life. But just the opposite is true. God knows exactly what we need, doesn't he? He knows what will bring you and I the most joy, the most happiness, the most excitement, the most love to our lives. And it isn't Satan. It's God, our creator. It isn't the father of lies, but the father of truth. The first lie Really, Satan was trying to get across to Eve and tries to get everyone to buy into is that our God is a restrictive God. But that couldn't be further from the truth. What about the second lie he tells to Eve? The second lie he wants to get her to believe is there are no consequences to actions. If we look again at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4, but the serpent said to the woman who had just said what God had told her, do not eat of it, do not even touch it, lest you shall die. The serpent said, no, 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 no. You will not surely die. He said, listen, listen, Eve, don't worry about the consequences of sin. There's no consequences. Listen, I know God said you'll die. I know he said don't do that, that there's consequences to doing that. But listen, there's really not. Again, this is the same lie he has perpetuated 
century after century after century. Time after time after time, he has tried to get people to believe and has been very successful in getting people to believe that their truth is all that matters. That what they want to do, eat, drink, and be happy, eat, drink, and be merry, that how they want to live their lives is the only thing that matters because there are no consequences to sin. Now, the world has dealt with this for a long time. In fact, even in uh, ancient times, biblical times, they were dealing with that. We talked about from uh, 1 John and other books of the Bible how Gnosticism had crept its, its uh, head up. One of the aspects of Gnosticism was, listen, all flesh is evil. And because all flesh is evil and there's nothing this flesh can do uh, to become righteous or be righteous in any way, eat, drink, and be merry because, listen, you can't be good. You can't be righteous. So listen, give up. Do whatever you want. Live life to the fullest because if this flesh is evil, there can't be any consequences. If God made you that way, he can't send you to anywhere but heaven. How many people think that way today? How many people will blame everybody and everything, including Satan under the sun, for their actions, for the things they're doing? My mama made me do it. My, my raising made me do it. I can't be held responsible for my own actions because I've been oppressed. Right now we're hearing a, a, a movement going on. Listen, I can't be held responsible for burning people's businesses and stealing and, and all these things. I can't be responsible for that. It's because someone else has made me by oppressing my life. God won't hold me responsible. I've been oppressed by this perpetual racism or bigotry or whatever the case might be used. As Satan told Eve, listen, you won't die from your sins. There's no real consequences for your actions. You won't have to answer to God for what you've done. Paul would say, however, in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. There are consequences, aren't there? Satan lied to Eve. She spiritually died the very moment. She took part of that fruit, of that fruit from that tree. She spiritually had no chance at heaven because of that one act. Unless a few verses later, God would say he would make an avenue. God didn't lie. Satan lied. The wages of sin is certainly death. There are consequences to everything we do. Paul would tell the church in Corinth there in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. There's no getting around it. Every single one of us, every single person is going to have to deal with the consequences of their choices and their actions. If to righteousness, then the blessings that come from that, the uh, reaping that comes from that sowing, if to unrighteousness, then the reaping that comes from that. We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There's no getting around it. The psalmist declared the same thing in Psalm 62, 12. And that you, O Lord, belong steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. You will render to him, you will give him that, or reap to him that which he sows. In line number two, Satan said, listen, there's no consequences, Eve. There's no consequences, world, to the sins that go on. 
There's no consequences to doing the wrong thing. If COVID-19 has taught us anything, it's that far too many have started believing that. I don't have to attend anymore. I can virtually do so, even though there's no scriptural reference for that. Even though all the evidence shows that, listen, this thing's not that much more deadly than the flu anymore. I must stay away from doing what God has prescribed. Now, I'm not saying there aren't situations where that might need to be done for health reasons. What I'm saying is far too many people are prescribing to Satan's lie that there's no consequences for my actions. If I want and feel this way, if I have this fear, then it must be right. My fear of COVID is overpowers consequences and a fear of God. What's the third lie Satan tells? Lie number three. And that was, you can be God. Now this sounds like a desperate move really on Satan's part. But nevertheless, it is a powerful move that he not only got Eve to believe, but gets a lot of people to believe. Notice how he said it there in Genesis 3 and verse 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, Satan wraps this in a very nice bow. It's got sparklies on it. It's, it probably smells good to, uh, in this uh, smell good sense, he might have put a little uh, fragrant oil on there. And he said, listen, if you do this wrong, if you do this sin, you'll be like God. Not God himself, you'll be like him. You'll be a God unto yourselves. You'll know good and evil. Don't you see the benefits of that? that you can make your own choices about what's right and wrong? You don't need God anymore. The truth of the matter is, many people today, inside and outside of the church, like to play God in their lives. They like to make decisions based on not what God would have us to do, but what I want to do. I'm in charge of my own life, so many say. I'm in charge of the things I do. Destiny is in my hands. Now, in a certain sense, that is true. Listen, the choices we make, as we talked about just a moment ago, the choices we make will determine our judgment. If we choose to be righteous and follow God, then obviously we will get to go to heaven. On that great day of judgment, if we choose unrighteousness and not following God, then we've made the choice uh, to spend eternity in damnation and hell away from God. But that's not what Satan is trying to get Eve to understand. What he's trying to get her to think like is he's trying to get her to play God. Listen, you can know what's right and wrong. You can make up the rules as you go. That's where man, because it becomes a God unto himself. If Satan can get us to believe that what we think is just as important or more important than God, he's got us, doesn't he? If he can get us to believe the lie that what we come up with as man, whether it be of our own or, or our trust in man, then we can be just fine. Think of the Jews, for example. The Jews had the book of traditions. It had been passed down year after year after year. It had grown to be uh, greater in size than the Bible itself at that time. And Jesus declared that this book of traditions was more important to the Jews than his word. That, as the proverb writer, as we looked at this morning and again tonight, would say, all the ways of man are pure in his own eyes. Now, the Jews didn't start out by making this commentary to try to go against God. They were trying to just simply follow God better. They were believing the lie that they knew better good from evil than God. 
that's where these things derive. The proverb writer there in 14.12, we've all known this. There's a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way to death. When we think about, look at and examine man's relationship to right and wrong, too many people get caught up in thinking and believing the lie of Satan. Listen, I can make my own decisions about what's right and what's wrong. Again, the proverb writer there in 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Satan, if he is able to get us to think that we know more than God, that we know right and wrong better than God, in other words, we don't always have a thus saith the Lord for what is right and wrong, that we have just made that choice, then Satan's got us to believe the lie that we are God and can make those decisions. But as you and I know, there is only one God, as Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 2.5. There's only one author of salvation, as we discussed this morning. And he is the only one that is truth and can demonstrate and show truth to us. Satan wants us to believe that God is restricted. That he doesn't care whether uh, if we sin or not because there's no consequences to sin and that we can literally determine ourselves if something is right or wrong. If Satan can get us to fall into any or all of these we lose focus of truth. Truth no longer matters because, as we've said before, the popular phrase, we have our own truth now. It's a lie. It's not true. But if Satan makes us or gets us, excuse me, to think it's true, we believed the father of lies. As we go outside these doors this evening, as we go throughout the rest of this week and the rest of our lives, let's make sure that we're not satisfied with maybes and assumptions. We're only satisfied with truth. That those things in which we cannot know for a fact, that we cannot know for truth, that we don't get caught up in those things because those things don't matter. But what God has given us through His Word, what God has taught us in His Word, is that truth is the most important thing and he is the father of truth and he has given us his mind written down by man inspired by him that we may have it for eternity and so let's you and i make sure we always take advantage of the truth of god's word because it's in that truth that we are always set or made free john chapter 8 verse 32 but if we don't know truth, if we don't go to the source of truth, if truth is not our goal in everything, then we're slaves to sin. So this evening, if there's someone here reflecting upon this, realizes maybe you've been struggling with this. Maybe you've been uh, looking at your own self uh, for direction rather than God as you should. Maybe you've been making decisions. Maybe you've Believe the lie, one of these lies of Satan or all of them, whatever the case is, if you find yourself in danger, make the necessary changes. Correct it. Do what's right. Go back to God through repentance. Confess that sin and live a faithful life. Let us help you if necessary. If you need that, let us help you bear that burden so that you can overcome. So this evening, if there's someone here who needs the prayers of this congregation, to have its love, its care, and concern to help you in this journey of life as we all strive to get to heaven. Let us know by coming forward as we stand. And as